Michael Boom, who was scheduled to uh, visit from Hamilton and talk last week. So he'll be rescheduled and research services will send out an announcement uh, when that happens. Um, this morning, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce one of our uh, C6 um, cardiology residents, Dr. Rudy Uni. Uh, he's going to be uh, presenting today on uh, transplantation and specifically xenotransplantation. So welcome. We look forward to your talk, Rudy. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, thanks everybody for coming up, uh, coming this morning to my uh, presentation. I'm going to talk to you guys about this really fascinating topic that has seen a ton of publicity and news over the last, you know, sort of one to two years. If you guys have seen the New England Journal and Nature and Jack publications, so um, it's it's very very exciting topic. Um, here's my arrow keys here. So my goals are to, you know, we'll first talk about the state of transplantation in Canada and. Um, organ shortages and the importance of expanding the donor pool. We'll talk a little bit about what DCD transplantation is, uh, and then we'll move on to xenotransplantation, what it's about, and we'll go over the case report that was published um, in 2020 or last year uh, in the New England Journal of, uh, of Medicine. So as, as I'm sure all of you know, uh, heart failure is a big problem uh, in Canada. About 100,000 people are diagnosed each year, and there's about just shy of a million people in Canada that currently live with heart failure, and that's up from 400,000 uh, in 2001. Heart failure carries a 21% annual readmission rate, and the median survival after diagnosis is about five years. Annual heart failure deaths exceed breast, colon, and prostate cancer combined, and heart failure costs the Canadian healthcare system about $10 billion per year. About 1 in 20 patients um, will experience refractory symptoms despite optimal medical therapy, device therapy, and surgical therapy, uh, and for these patients, uh, median survival is measured in months. And cardiac transplantation is currently the definitive treatment for these patients with stage D advanced heart failure. Why is that the case? Because heart failure is or because transplantation is really good in these patients. So median survival uh, of these patients now exceeds 12 years. Um, one year survival is around 90% in North America. Transplant patients who survive that first year have improvements in all aspects of their health related quality of life. More than 70% of patients can complete normal ADLs with minimal or no symptoms and robust multi organ transplant programs are developing all across uh, North America. So heart and kidney, heart, lung and, and heart liver. Uh, if you look at our transplant volumes over the last sort of decade or two, we've kind of had steady numbers, about 170 transplants per year. The U.S. does double that per capita, and we're sort of middle of the pack uh, when we look at European transplant centers. Let's look at the actual process of, of how a patient gets to cardiac transplant. So if you start with a stage D heart failure patient, of which there's about 30,000 Canadians diagnosed per year, if they're re referred in a timely manner to a transplant clinic, an evaluation takes place looking for indications as well as contraindications, including pulmonary hypertension and active malignancy. If there are no contraindications to transplant, then patients are listed on the wait list of their transplant center. And, and when a donor is identified, the characteristics of, the, of that heart are reviewed by the transplant committee and surgeon for donor characteristics that would make a heart a good fit and predict a good prognosis. And those are things like size matching, blood group matching, as well as immune compatibility, which we will talk about. Um, if the heart is accepted, transplant is arranged. And after transplantation, then there's a number of things that also predict short term, uh, poor short term and long term survival. So those are things like uh, transplanting a patient who's on a ventilator or a retransplant, for example. Um, and then there's major elements of, of care for these patients afterwards. So that could involve navigating things like primary graft dysfunction in the short term to in the long term, things like rejection, infection and, and uh, coronary allograft vasculopathy. So unfortunately, there's a rising demand uh, in uh, uh, for, for transplants. So there's a rising number of patients with heart failure and those progressing to stage D. And there's also not a relative increase uh, in supply. So the number of hearts offered for donation each year is not growing and more hearts are rejected than accepted by by most transplant programs. And this has to do with transplant programs really looking to achieve the best possible outcomes for their patients that are transplanted. In 2023, about 100 patients were present on the transplant wait list nationally with an average wait time of 453 days uh, waiting for a heart. And uh, if you look at U.S. data, that actually suggests that about one in five people will die while waiting on the transplant list and most of them early into their into their listing. 
Canada has unique geographic challenges when looking at transplants. So we have eight cardiac transplant centers across Canada. The U.S. has a, over 140. And we also have a very low population density, which promotes long travel times for organs, uh, which is associated with, with worse functions. So, you know, if you compare Toronto and Montreal, which are the largest population centers outside of Ottawa, the larger population means, you know, that's where most of your, uh, you know, donors may potentially come from. Compare that to the distance between Boston and Washington, D.C., that eastern seaboard, there's way more, there's just way more people. So how do we expand the donor pool? And this has been a significant area of focus in the last decade of transplantation. So one important method, for example, is using extended criteria hearts. So that's using hearts that are, you know, considered less than perfect or not, you know, not just perfect. So there's a number of characteristics of these hearts that have traditionally led to these hearts being declined by transplant uh, programs. So that's, uh, you know, such as an older age or an ejection fraction that's less than 50%. And, you know, recent data has shown reasonably comparable survival rates for these patients if they only have one or two extended criteria. Another way of expanding the donor pool is, expect, is accepting patients with certain infectious characteristics. So historically, donors with hep C viremia were not accepted, but we now know hep C is curable. And many centers in Canada and the U.S. accept hep C hearts after informed consent, and patients are just treated afterwards. Uh, and other examples, including HIV and COVID-19, there's early data uh, and attempts to transplant patients, uh, do, uh, transplant patients with donors who, are, uh, who have these infections. So what about DCD transplantation? So that's something you also may have heard of. That stands for donation after circulatory death. And in order to understand this, you need to understand that in Canada, the, the current modality for heart transplantation is donation after brain death. So what is brain death? So that's defined as the permanent cessation of brain function, which is defined as the absence of consciousness, the absence of brainstem, and the absence of capacity to breathe with formal apnea testing. And transplant from donors with brain death, meaning the heart is still beating at the time of organ procurement, means avoiding this agonal period of warm ischemia and hypoperfusion. And after brain death was defined in the late 1960s, heart transplantation shifted to donation after brain death. The first transplant was actually a DCD, um, DCD donor. Um, and in Canada, currently right now, all hearts come from patients that are that meet the criteria for brain death. And this is how, in, in case you aren't familiar, this is how that, that process works. So after brain death is diagnosed in the ICU, uh, the Provincial Organ Procurement and Transplant Network, so in Ontario that's Trillium, uh, is, uh, is involved and the donor gets an extensive assessment. If there is a match to a recipient, the neurologically deceased patient is then taken to the OR, sternotomy is performed, the heart and the great vessels are dissected carefully. Once dissection orbital and organ mobilization is complete, the recipient teams are contacted to confirm readiness. And when everything is ready to go, the heart uh, is then uh, arrested with cold cardioplegia. The great vessels, including the aorta, are cross-clamped. In the standard by cable technique, the SVC and the IVC and all the branches of the ascending order are divided. The heart is retracted. The posterior wall of the left atrium is divided. And then the heart is explanted. This heart is then transported to the recipient in two ways. The standard in Canada right now is, is what it's been for the last 50 years. The heart is double bagged and put into an ice cooler and transported to the to the recipient. Recently, there's something called a Sherpa pack, which has been in, which has been invented. It's used in some centers in the US where the heart sits in a proprietary fluid in a fancy, a fancy ice cooler uh, that keeps the heart at a very precise temperature. And that might be associated with improved graft function. Once the heart arrives uh, at the recipient site, it's transported right to the operating room of the recipient. It's implanted into the body. When the recipient comes off bypass, that's when your ischemic time stops. Uh, the chest is closed and the patient is transported back to the CSICU with various levels of hemodynamic support. Uh, so, the, and, and patients are usually extubated within 24 to 48 hours. So that's the traditional pathway. This, that's donation after brain death. Since 2015, there's been advances in organ perfusion techniques which have allowed for DCD donation of hearts in many centers across the US, UK, and Australia. And so all DCD donations follow the same, same few steps. You have donor recipient matching, and then when accepted, there's withdrawal of lysostaining therapy in the OR. As the you know, as circulatory death occurs, there's a waiting period, a tribute is paid to the patient in the OR, and then the heart is rapidly reperfused, restarted, and then function of the heart is, is assessed. So the heart's allowed to recover after that circulatory death. And if the function is good and accepted, it's transplanted into the recipient. And that's step number four, reperfusing the heart. That's where there's two techniques, reperfusing inside the heart or inside the body. So that's in situ or reperfusing outside the body. That's called ex situ. And so if you look at ex situ perfusion uh, for DCD um, after explantation in the OR, so this, there's Tronotomy, the heart's open, the heart is flushed with cold preservation solution, taken out of the body, reperfused with warmed blood, and placed onto an ex vivo machine. So that's what that machine looks like. 
Uh, right now, there's only one uh, machine like this used in the U.S. It's called OCS, the Organ Care System, by a company called Transmedics. And over 270 hearts in the U.S. have been have been uh, transplanted using this ex situ perfusion. So perfusion, assessment of function, if everything's good, gets transplanted into the recipient. Uh, the other method is called uh, in situ reperfusion. So this is the exact same process. Initially, you have withdrawal of life-sustaining therapies in the OR. Death is declared. The chest is opened. And then the patient is cannulated for ECMO allowing for reperfusion of the heart. However, in order to prevent reperfusion of the brain, because permanent inability of reperfusion to the brain is what we're defining as death, the vessels supplying the brain are clamped. And that's kind of controversial in some uh, in some centers. Um, but regardless, the ECMO circuit reperfuses the heart, the heart's allowed to recover, there's assessment of the heart function, and then that allows for transplantation, uh, or the heart is procured and transported on ice to the donor or. And DCD transplantation has been shown to significantly increase organ utilization. It's expanded the donor pool by about 20 to 30 percent. Um, it's expensive. So it's about, four, you know, estimated 40 percent more cost per heart compared to standard donation after brain death. Uh, but there was an RCT um, from from this year or from last year that showed you know pretty similar one year outcomes between DCD patients and DVD patients. And a Canadian DCD program has been in development for quite some time, uh, but we have yet to do our first uh, DCD patient. So we've talked about a couple of methods of expanding the donor pool, extended criteria hearts, infectious uh, considerations, DCD donors, opt-out donor registration is something as well that that uh, that has been explored. So now let's talk about xenotransplantation. Um, so xenotransplantation is defined as the transplantation of living cells, tissues, or organs from one species to another. And xenotransplantation actually has a very storied history uh, in medicine. Ever since there were medical ailments, people have been trying to merge animals with humans and, and and for disastrous results essentially so in the 17th century the, you know the first case of xenotransplantation was a blood transfusion done by a french surgeon uh, trying to transfuse blood into uh, from a lamb into a 15 year old male with a fever didn't work out obviously uh, and the french and english parliaments eventually banned transfusions because of these poor outcomes in the 1800s, uh, corneal transplants, so a pig cornea into the eye uh, of a patient uh, were attempted. Skin xenografts, so you know, really in the history of plastic surgery, skin xenografts have been attempted from all sorts of different animals. Uh, in the 20th century, Voronoff, who's a French surgeon, attempted to rejuvenate elderly men by transplanting chimpanzee testic testicles, testicular transplants, to try and elevate energy levels in, in, uh, in, in older men. So all these, you know, of course, with disastrous results. These are pure experimentation. You know, we don't really know the results. The first really sort of, you know, uh, attempt by a modern uh, physician was Dr. Rietzma in the early 60s. He transplanted 13 chimpanzee kidneys into humans. Um, and one patient survived with nine months with perfectly intact grass dysfunction and died from some some other cause. So that was the first um, uh, first one kind of done, uh, you know, by a real, uh, you know, sort of modern, modern, modern day. The first cardiac transplantation, uh, xenotransplantation, was done in 1964, three years before the first human allo transplant ever done. That was done by this, this guy, Dr. Hardy, using a chimpanzee donor in a patient with cardiogenic shock. The heart was undersized, the developed rejection, the patient died quickly within two hours. And, and two other attempts were made in the early 60s. Both died within minutes. And then in 67, Dr. Christian Barnard completed the first uh, human uh, transplant, the first allo transplant, human to human, and that patient lived a month. And so because of this, you know, much higher success rate, the world kind of focused on human uh, human allo transplantation. That didn't stop Barnard from attempting two more xenotransplants uh, in 1977. Baby Fay was the last sort of big important attempt in the U.S. So in 1984, this surgeon, Dr. Bailey in Missouri, transplanted a baboon heart into a newborn infant with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And it was, I think, it was an intended as a bridge to a human allo transplant. There was a technical success, but patient developed hyperacute rejection after about three weeks. And uh, there was significant media coverage all over the U.S. about this experimental and unproven treatment. And there was kind of like a moratorium placed on attempts at xenotransplantation after this. To date, there have been 14 attempts since the 1960s at full cardiac xenotransplantations, all coming from different types of animals, as you can see, no patients really surviving more than a few days until 2022, and we'll talk about that shortly. And as you can see recently, pig hearts have been the graft of choice for xenotransplants. So let's briefly talk about why the porcine model is actually 
the optimal model um, so far as compared with non-human primates. So uh, a couple of things. So in terms of the development, in a porcine model, the heart reaches full size at about a year. And if you compare that with some non-human primates, which takes up to seven years, you see there's advantages in trying to use you know, this model in terms of research and testing. It turns out that the, uh, oh, and the FDA has also banned sort of non-human primate donors due to risk of, of zoonoses. Um, the anatomy of the pig heart is, is nearly identical um, to the uh, to the human heart. So apart from the fact that it sits sort of horizontal in the thorax, it's nearly identical, you know, sort of body to uh, heart to body weight ratios. There's very slight anatomic differences. So pigs have two pulmonary veins versus four. The valvular anatomy is also nearly identical. The hemodynamics of a pig heart are nearly identical. So mean cardiac output is about five liters per minute. The mean peer pressures are the same, et cetera. The coronary anatomy of, of, uh, of, of, of pig hearts is also essentially identical. There's left main LED, a circumflex, and right dominant circulation with an RCA. Interestingly, aging pigs develop atherosclerosis. They're one of the few animals that, that actually develop atherosclerosis. And in terms of, uh, from an electrophysiology perspective, again, very, very similar. Because of a lower SA node, there's a shorter PR interval. And, and, and also a very important part about why porcine models are maybe optimal is that, you know, as a society in, in, in sort of the Western Hemisphere, we're used to growing and farming, uh, you know, pigs for human consumption. So that makes it a lot more palatable than sort of expanding non-human primate, uh, you know, farming, of course. Uh, so one of the staff, um, yes, or this week, last week, I came up to me and said, Rudy, why, why are you talking about pig hearts? What, what, what's, what's going on? Why, why do we care about this? Why are we talking about this now? Um, and the reason is because in the last eight years, there have been huge breakthroughs um, made in avoiding rejection, thanks to genetic engineering. And it's worth knowing about it as you as this field is exploding right now. In order to understand this, we have to do a brief primer on transplant immunology. And I promise that if you follow along just these next few slides, everything will be uh, you will understand uh, all of, of sort of the attempts at xenotransplantation. And we start with this one question, which is why don't your T cells and your B cells attack? your own organs? Why don't they attack your own organs? And the answer is very simple. It's because every cell in your human body has kind of like a, a QR code, has a, expresses a QR code on the cell membrane that says, hey, I am me, and it's unique to you. And so as your T cells float around, they come around, they scan the QR code on the uh, on the cell membrane, and they say, ah, this, this cell belongs to me. This is not a foreign cell or foreign, you know, something that I have to attack. When you transplant a graft from another human with cells that express a different QR code, or if one of your circulating antigen presental cells picks up a piece of that graft DNA uh, that, again, it's not from you, the T cells scan, they act, and then they say, this is foreign material, and they activate your immune system. So the first thing they do is they can activate T helper cells and cytotoxic T cells, which recruit a whole army of leukocytes to come attack the graft. They can trigger B cells to produce antibodies to that particular QR code. Uh, and they can also activate the complement system. And so when, when we talk about what is rejection in transplant medicine, really it's evidence of one of two, these two pathways, either evidence of these T cell recruited leukocytes infiltrating the graft or evidence of complement and antibodies uh, 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 adhered to the graft or attacking the graft. And that's called antibody mediated rejection. And so when you, when you, you know, in humans, the most important QR code system is the HLA system or the human leukocyte antigen system. And it's very aptly named, right? It's an antigen or trigger to human leukocytes. And the QR code scanner is called the T-cell receptor. There are other two, two other important QR code systems. Uh, one is the ABO system. So these are carbohydrate, carbohydrates found on red blood cells, uh, typically on erythrocytes. But these antigens are also often found on the membrane of donor tissue. Uh, and there are other antigens as well. Uh, so what we call non-HLA antigens. Understanding these mechanisms is what sort of the last 70 years of transplant immunology has been about, is understanding these QR codes and why rejection uh, occurs. And so very understandably, in early xenotransplantation, we had no idea what was going on. We're putting pig hearts into patients and they are rejecting and we are, you know, we're saying, ah, oh, this is a failure because we didn't understand really what the antigens were. In addition to making advances and identifying what these QR codes, what these triggers are, there's a unique potential in xenotransplantation, which is that CRISPR-Cas9 technology, which was invented about eight years ago, allows us for rapid and precise insertion of uh, insertion or removal of genes into a genome. So with xenotransplants, we can find out what the QR code is and edit it out. And that's different than human allotransplantation. Um, we can not only remove immunogenic antigens, but we can introduce familiar human-like proteins uh, to prevent rejection as well. 
So right now in labs that study xenotransplantation uh, using porcine donor models and often using non-human primates as uh, surrogate recipient models due to the similar to humans, this is what's happening right now. So you, so labs are implanting porcine xenotransplants into non-human primate models. They identify the cause of rejection and they use CRISPR-Cas9 to edit the genome to create a new generation of porcine model to try again. And this is happening very, very rapidly. Um, I'm going to walk you through the current progress to get to the latest iteration of the of the of the of the porcine model. So in 1995, we discovered this thing, which is alpha gal, alpha galactose one through galactose, which is a sugar that's that's located on the cell surface of all pigs, all all uh, all, all porcine. I think it's actually all mammals except for primates, including humans. And it turns out that you know some hundred, you know, millions of years ago, our, uh, humans evolved out anti gal. We used to express it but we still retain the antibodies. So all of us have natural antibodies to this sugar that's on the surface of porcine hearts. So genetic engineering allowed for alpha-gal to be completely removed from the cell membrane. And once this was removed, hyperacute rejection improved dramatically in primate models. And so this is what the current, the, in the current generation we have now are 10 genes that have been edited. Alpha-gal has been removed. There's an immunogenic porcine blood group called SDA that's removed. Uh, another immunogenic glycan called new 5 gc removed. It turns out in the early models, they would put these pig hearts into baboons and then the pig heart would just keep growing and expand past the thorax. So how do they fix that? They removed the growth hormone receptor on the heart and now the pig's heart staying the normal size. We've introduced a, uh, a couple of human proteins as well. So there's two complement regulation proteins that have been added into the latest iterations, that's CD46 and DAF. Um, we found out that some of the rejection had to do with a lot of vascular thrombosis, and so uh, some antithrombotic proteins that were found normally on human cells were added, uh, as well as some other molecules as well, including something called hemooxidase and CD47. And so this, these 10 gene edits, this 10 gene edit pig is the latest iteration um, uh, produced by a company called Revivacore, and this is the model that has been used in those recent publications in the last two years, this 10 gene edit pig. And there's other companies now coming out that are competing. So another company uses a smaller mini pig, and so they don't need to bother with the growth hormone receptor knockout. And so in 2022, the FDA granted compassionate use um, for, for a case to be used at the University of Maryland, done by these two surgeons, Dr. Griffith and Dr. Mohiuddin. And so I'm going to go through that case with you now uh, in, in detail. So this is the patient. Uh, it was a gentleman by the name of Mr. David Bennett. He's a 57-year-old guy with hypertension, a previous mitral valve repair, and he has non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. His, his EF was 10% with severe RV dysfunction. And he was admitted with heart failure. He progressed to sky E cardiogenic shock, he had multiple VT arrests, and he was, he was eventually cannulated onto VA ECMO on, on day 23. And he was denied by multiple programs, unfortunately due to a history of a long history of non-adherence to medications. And so this is the patient that the program approached and they said, hey, you know, would you, you know, would you like to undergo experimental as, you know, transplantation? We have we have nothing for you. And his only response is, will I oink, which I think is hilarious. Uh, and, and he agreed to, to be part of this, uh, to be the study. And so um, if we talk briefly about the surgical technique, they used a biatrial anastomosis, which is slightly different. And that's to accommodate a little bit of a size mismatch. It was an NDD donation. They actually took the pig heart and put it on a fancy ex vivo uh, perfusion system similar to OCS. Uh, the total cold ischemia time was 150 minutes. The implant required 63 minutes. And then after the release of the aorta crossbone, they actually realized they caused a big type A dissection. And so they had to fix that with an endograph, and that took another 13 minutes of circulatory arrest. In terms of the immunosuppression use, so you know, typically in humans, we have a lot of um, we have a lot of a lot of um, agents that kind of target T cells. So, you know, if patients get inducted with something called antithymocyglobulin, we get, they get steroids, calcineurin inhibitors, and, and an anti-metabolite. Um, this patient received, um, based on their testing, the lab's testing, they received kind of B-cell targeted therapy. So that's rituximab. Uh, they also got Berenert, which is a, a type of complement inhibitor. And then they also, uh, the patient also received a specifically designed monoclonal antibody to CD40. And CD40 is a, um, it's a, it's a co-stimulatory ligand that's involved in activation of, of B-cells. Uh, I'm not going to go over this too much in too much detail, but the full immunosuppression um, schedule has been published, as you can see. Um, the patient also received um, uh, uh, gancyclovir and then multiple infusions of platelets because, uh, as I said, he was thrombocytic uh, before. Um, this is what his chest actually looked like on day one. Day two, extubated. Um, he did he did develop oligeric, uh, oligoenuric renal failure requiring dialysis, and he was decannulated completely from ECMO on day four. 
On day six, his PA catheter was removed, and this was a hemodynamic, so you know, relatively normal cardiac output, blood pressure, and, 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 and PA pressures. On day 12, he actually developed a peritonitis, and he actually had an exploratory laparotomy for bowel thickening. They found an abscess there. We removed that. Um, and then on day 34, he underwent a biopsy, which showed no cellular and no antibody-mediated rejection, patients undergoing rehab. Those were his uh, hemodynamics at that point. On day 43, he developed, and by the way, this is, we're talking about 43 days, so it's a month post-transplant. The patient developed some kind of septic shock. He was intubated. Uh, when they did bronchoscopy, they showed all these shallow ulcers suggestive of viral infection. And then of all the titers they did, something called porcine CMV became positive. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. They started an antiviral just in case that was driving the infection, uh, and that was to good effect. Uh, Excavated again on day 45. Uh, on day 48, the patient is sitting alone in his chair. He's waving to his caregivers. He, he actually was free from bed for the first time in 100 days. So this was, I mean, this is not a well man, obviously. This is, you know, a guy who's significantly frail and has had these surgical complications. Now he's on dialysis, uh, but was what was clearly improving. And then suddenly on day 49, uh, his lactate jumps up. He gets reintubated. He's clearly in cardiogenic shock. And then um, this is what his echo looks like. So this first picture here is a peripheral short axis uh, on day one. So as you can see, pretty robust uh, graft function. Um, and then on day two, or on this is on day 49, very thickened heart, uh, diastolic dysfunction despite normal systolic function, a marked reduction in global longitudinal strain. Um, he gets recannulated onto VA ECMO, unfortunately, due to this progressive cardiogenic shock. He undergoes another biopsy, no cellular rejection, no antibody mediated rejection, but now he's but he's got a lot of capillary damage in in his graft with extravasated erythrocytes, edema. Um, uh, there's no evidence of complement activation um, per se. And there's a single ischemic myocyte on on biopsy. Um, then in the next couple of days, he's got rising troponins. He's got a rising uh, what we call xenograft cell-free DNA, which uh, uh, is essentially a marker of graft injury. Um, and then uh, on repeat biopsies, now it's suggested that maybe he was having an atypical antibody mediated rejection. He received uh, plasma chains extrapheresis, IVIG, uh, rituximab, ecolizumab, you know, sorry, sort of targeting the immune system, you know, as aggressively as possible. And throughout all this, he was awake on ECMO support, but encouraging treatment. He wanted to keep going. Um, and then on day 56, again, repeat biopsy now shows like horrific necrosis throughout the graft, um, vascular damage. Um, and eventually they, they, they talked to the patient and said, you know, this is sort of graft failure. We don't really have options for you. And, uh, and the patient was withdrawn uh, or, or sort of life sustaining their uh, care was, was withdrawn. And this is his autopsy. Uh, as you can see, the heart weight had doubled up to 600 grams from 300. Um, and the myocytes were uh, widely spaced, central nuclei separated by thin bands of, of fibrosis. Uh, lots of lots of myocyte necrosis. So to summarize, despite surgical complications, the xenograft maintained hemodynamic function for seven weeks. Uh, they used the CD40-based therapy that prevented obvious hyperacute rejection. The recovery was complicated by this intradominal sepsis followed by pneumosepsis, possibly from the CMV infection, which we will talk about. Uh, and then he developed a strange form of like sudden onset vascular rejection, atypical for known mechanisms of, of rejection. Uh, and so there's a lot of sort of uh, questions as to why this happened. Could it have been the severe sepsis that he had? He received some IVIG, and then could it have been this porcine infection? So um, they screened the donor pig for porcine CMV. Again, but we'll talk about it. It's not a later slide, but um, uh, the screening was was negative. And then eventually after infection was uh, identified, they did a splenic biopsy of the donor pig, and that was positive. So maybe the pig had some sort of latent CMV, porcine CMV, that was not detected by their screening methods. So maybe a failure of their screening. But we don't know whether that resulted in, injection, in, in rejection. Within a few months, second case was done. This patient lived 42 days. There's been a third and fourth case as well onto NDD patients, mainly for sort of testing and data acquiring. Uh, and both of these patients, there's no evidence of, of early uh, zoonotic transmission. And there's also been two cases of pig to human kidney uh, xenotransplantation. Again, uh, a study of xenotransplantation into patients with brain death uh, using the same 10 gene edit porcine function with uh, porcine model with excellent early graft function. Um, and, and just to kind of give you a glimpse at, at what's coming in the lab in baboons, the longest non-human primate model to live with a new uh, porcine heart has been three years. So we, we, so three years survival in a non-human primate model with a uh, with, uh, transplanted heart. So that's that's where we are now. There's, there's, you know, as you can, as hopefully as you can see, there's been a lot of progress made in this field very quickly, like in the last two, three years. There's a lot of next steps. So we have to understand what that vascular rejection was. 
Um, they're uh, the team that did this uh, procedure. They're pending an FDA investigational new drug uh, sort of application for an approval. And I think obviously, you know, further compassionate use will be driving experience uh, experience in these cases until trials are approved. We don't know what the optimal anti rejection uh, regimen is. Um, uh, and, and obviously, there was this failure of screening for porcine viruses. And there are three centers now in the U.S. Maryland, NYU, Langone, and uh, Alabama uh, that are moving forward with, uh, or that have moved forward with with human trials. And the company that that did this procedure is now building this massive facility where they can raise uh, these genetically modified pigs uh, and again do that cycle of progressive iteration improvement uh, for their hearts. So, what does the future look like? You know, there's a lot of questions to ask. Um, you know, and, and the potential is very impressive. So at some point, you know, could pig hearts, if the outcomes improve, could they become more available than human hearts shortening wait lists? That's definitely, you know, that's that's hopefully the sort of that's the aim here. Um, and it's unclear whether xenotransplants will ever approach or even eclipse the current outcomes of human allografts. Another question that people have brought up is, is it possible to personalize a graft to a specific patient based on their HLA and non-HLA antigen? So they actually have inserted an HLA antigen into the membrane of a, of a, of a pig model to try and, uh, you know, again, make it more familiar to T cells. And then identifying the right patient. So um, this is a good question. You know, at some point, maybe let's say 10 years from now, the outcomes of, uh, of, of these pigs may be worse than allografts, but still pretty good, maybe better than ventricular cyst devices. So if that's the case, who gets who should get those patients that are sort of substandard? Um, Reduction in immunosuppression. Obviously, the goal here is, you know, now we're, we're asking ourselves, is it possible to engineer a graph that requires little to no immunosuppression at all? And that would be, you know, extremely helpful in the context of long term malignancy. Uh, and then costs. Right now, the cost they've estimated about a minimum of five hundred thousand dollars per heart. Obviously, I think they're underestimating, you know, including all of the cares is going to be in the multiple millions. But again, as supply increases, once you have sort of founder pigs, if they're able to breed and sort of create this large supply, then hopefully the costs uh, can go down. This guy here is Norm Shumway, who is who is the first American uh, surgeon to transplant a heart, and he has this hilarious quote, which is a uh, xenotransplantation is the future and always will be. Uh, for heart, so so he he may be you know a little pessimistic, but uh, um, but it was I thought that was funny to include. So zoonotic transmission. So so disease, zoonotic disease is, is disease caused by pathogens shared between animals and humans, and this has been at the forefront of xenotransplantation science. So there's a number of pig specific pathogens that have been identified. Um, so these include porcine CMV, cytomegalovirus, uh, porcine lympho lymphotrophic herpes virus, and then uh, something called porcine endogenous retroviruses. We don't really know whether these these viruses are important or not. Um, they've never been shown to uh, actually infect or attack a human cell. In all the biopsies they did of those ulcers in this patient, everything was negative. Um, and um, and, and in vitro, it's never um, neither CMV or ALV, uh, ALHV have ever shown to infect a human cell. Um, regardless, um, P CMV may be something of particular importance uh, as uh, in donors with porcine CMV into the non-human primate model. There was increased graft failure. Um, currently, there's you know extensive efforts they have claimed to try and prevent infection. So extensive screening of the porcine models, antiviral drugs and vaccinations to these pigs, strict isolation of these animals. So as these animals are 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 um, are developed in the labs, there's, there's strict isolation. They were actually undergoing cesarean delivery to prevent any sort of vaginal transmission from the from the pig to the to the graft. All these are advances in this animal husbandry, which has been very important um, in sort of developing. Uh, developing this and then of course ethical considerations so animal welfare of course you know is this different really than farming lots of pigs for human consumption which is food now we're farming them for organ transplantation this has been brought up is you know how you know is that ethical um all of this interspecies testing how do we ensure sort of animal welfare and and, and care for these uh for the animals during this process Societal acceptance, so obviously religious and cultural beliefs around pigs and swine will, will play a role um, when sort of considering the expansion of xenotransplantation. Resource allocation, again, competing costs of developing this therapy versus the societal cost of the burden of stage D heart failure patients, uh, including death of patients who do not wake it on, uh, you know, make it uh, on the wait list. And then fairness, who should receive these hearts? So, and, and even as compassionate use. So as I mentioned, the patient in question was a, was a gentleman who was rejected for non-adherence. And so the plan here to, you know, if at some point in the future, like five years down the road, if survival is two, three years, 
if we're still using as compassionate use, are we going to put these hearts into patients that are non adhered to their immunosuppression? Really, you know, the only compassionate use patients that would be considered for these patients are patients that are surgical candidates. And so the other contraindications are essentially non adherence, psychosocial issues, substance issues, and comorbidities. And so is it really fair to be transplanting? these hearts that require immunosuppression onto those patients. That's it's, it's not clear yet whether whether this will be a fair thing to do. Obviously, dangers of, of zoonotic transmission to the broader public. Uh, the hope is that there will be societal good with with xenotransplantation as this expands in terms of relief and waitlist. And then again, you know, someone's brought up potential to eliminate coercion and final comp financial compensation for organs, which is a problem in, in other parts of the world. Um, and then the last sort of slide I have is that xenotransplantation outside of cardiology is also growing. So there's there's a number of labs all studying different things. Uh, this graph on the left here shows the longest survival of xenotransplanted organs or tissues in humans. Um, so in 2007, they had uh, somebody live, you know, more than 3,000 days with pancreatic islet cell transplants for, for type 1 diabetes, um, uh, or at least models, excuse me, not these won't be in, in patients. Uh, and then there's also uh, kidney. So this is in uh, 1984 uh, by Ritzma et al. Uh, and then there's also, uh, and then these are uh, livers um, as well in baboon uh, baboon models into a human, human model. So there's, there's lots of work going on looking at uh, sort of other organs as well in addition. Um, so in summary, um, you know, hopefully I've demonstrated that there's, you know, there's a clear need to grow the cardiac dan transplant uh, donor pool. Um, you know, current things, including extended criteria hearts and DCD transplantation have been done. I think hopefully you'll agree that xenotransplantation is a very exciting field that in the last five years has seen this rapid growth. And, and CRISPR-Cas9 technology, which has really only been around for eight years, is what has allowed for this rapid advances in engineering and immunocompatible uh, graft. Cardiac xenotransplantation has now been attempted four times in the past year and is currently limited by an unknown vascular rejection. Uh, and obviously, there's you know there's many years for further uh, immunologic optimization before this technology becomes uh, you know widely accepted or used in a clinical uh, way. But but you should know now that the FDA applications have already been uh, submitted for um, for investigational new use. So you're you're going to see lots more of this uh, in our careers. Perfect. That's all I have. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rudy. That's uh, that was a great overview, and it's the first time I've ever seen an MHC uh, compared to a QR code, which definitely aligns my uh, generational gap. <laughs> so, uh, but that's a great analogy. I've never heard of it referred to that way, but that's a good way to explain it. Um, I, have you heard? Um, in Europe, is this being explored uh, the same way it is in North America? I, I don't think there's a lab yet in Europe that has done this. The, the majority of the work, you know, after that 1984 case in the US, that baby, um, baby Faye, like that had so much negative press that there was almost like a moratorium, like those words were used, like a moratorium on xenotransplantation in sort of the US and Europe. Obviously, you know, there's really only one or two centers one being this Alabama at Birmingham that was having funding to do this over the last sort of 10, 10, 15 years. Um, I, I, as far as I know, there isn't a European lab that's spending the millions of dollars and, uh, you know, to be able to, to, to do this, but I, but I, it, it, it is probably coming. I think, I think these, the last, you know, the last two years with these many attempts, and then especially the fact that the, the, the non-human primate model that has survived three years, uh, you know, that is, that is definitely showing some promise. So I'm, I'm sure that, that this will expand, but cost will be the biggest issue for the, for the short term. Yeah, I think the cost is an important thing to, to have a good think about. Uh, transplantation is not inexpensive in its current form. Uh, this takes it to a whole a whole new level, hey? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's 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 still a scary. You know, when you look at the mean, like the mean age of Canadians, it's like fifty eight or or fifty nine. Like that silver tsunami is still like still coming. Um, so you know, there's there's a need. There's going to be a huge number of stage D patients that are going to be clogging or, you know, you know, affecting our healthcare system. So, a lot of cost coming. Uh, the CMV, uh, I think just important for everybody to know, in case you don't know, that human CMV remains um, a, a significant uh, comorbidity that these patients uh, deal with and that we have to deal with more often than we would like to. Um, so, yes, the porcine CMV is is a consideration, um, but it should be known, you know, that that's not unique in, or unique to porcine. Uh, so humans have CMV as well, and it is a big problem. 
uh, in the in the transplant population that we are constantly battling. Yeah, so um, so I, I'm not surprised that that it popped up in this in this model uh, yeah. as well. I think the other thing, uh, transplant has a, a large ethical um, component to it. I think this adds another layer of ethics that is even more complicated. And so we're taking a field that is already uh, controversial at times, let's put it that way. Um, and, and this is going to really kick it to a whole new level if this becomes prime time. We're yeah. not near it yet. And to be honest, I'm hopeful that I'll retire before this comes prime time because <laughs> uh, this is going to take the ethics to a to a whole new level of discussion. Definitely. Um, yeah. In your reading about preparing for this, have you seen many articles? I actually haven't looked at it, but have you seen any articles sort of discussing some of the ethical issues? You outlined some of them there, but but this is going to be uh, big point of discussion. Definitely, definitely. It, it's, you know, it's, it's worth knowing that xenotransplantation research has actually been going on for the, you know, for the last two decades. The WHO, the FDA, the Canadian Health, uh, like CanadaHealth.gov, they all have published sort of xenotransplantation guidelines, uh, consideration of ethics, uh, you know, basic practices and research or good clinical practices and research. Um, you know, it's it's been at the forefront of all of this research for the last sort of 20 years, um, and of course the this um, you know this the success or or this case report from from produce sparked you know commentary from from all sorts of bodies about whether or not this will be ethical or not. Um, um, I don't think that there are clear answers yet in terms of what will be accepted or not, um, and certainly again. The big question that I have is because human allograft transportation is so good, you know, let's say in 10 years, if the graft is eight, you know, the last let's say eight years or something, who, sh who, who would say yes to that? Who should get those hearts? It's not like we don't we don't know those answers yet. Um, it will be a point of discussion for sure for, for a long time, I think, especially with this zoonotic transmission, because, uh, you know, there's always concern that a poor sense specific pathogen can be passed to a human, which then could pass to another human. So I think I think we're, we're those issues will need to be straightened out before this becomes. Uh, sort of clinically used. Uh, one of the comments in the chat is from uh, uh, Dr. Quan Chan. Uh, his comment is the comparator is total artificial heart. Uh, how to decide versus xenotransplant? Yeah, that's a good question. To my, I mean, uh, and I might rely on on sort of your expertise as well. You know, to my understanding, total artificial artificial hearts, total artificial hearts have not yet seen sort of robust survival or outcomes compared to uh, either ventricular assist devices or um, or uh, or, card or human allografts. I believe there are one or two centers in the U.S. that have still attempted total artificial hearts. Usually, as a I think it's a as a bridge, but I'm but I'm not 100% sure. Um, uh, I don't I don't know. In this center, have we done a total artificial heart in in a number of years? Yeah. Yeah. So we don't have total artificial yeah. heart uh, technology at our center. It, you know, um, some uh, centers in the U.S. have it, um, but again, it's not it's not um, and it's also done in Montreal. Sorry, thank you, Dr. Chief, for reminding me that. Uh, but we don't have it here. Yeah. Um, and certainly, uh, it's not uh, not as durable as current transplantation. Yeah. Um, and and our current LVADs. I mean, you've said approximately five years um, survival for LVAD. I think it might be a little bit longer now with the current iteration of mm -hmm. LVAD devices. Um, uh, but that being said. Um, Total artificial heart is not going to be a long-term solution, and they're generally, um, you know, they don't go home with the device. Yeah. So it, it's a bridge. Okay. Um, I think that takes us to the end of uh, our presentation. Thank you so much, Rudy. That's uh, definitely yeah. thought-provoking. Uh, please join us next week for rounds. Um, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, left atrial appendages. So um, we'll see you next week. Have a good week.